I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. The other day I saw a help wanted ad for a self-driving car engineer. Right. So five years ago, that would have been like an ad out of Blade Runner, like a science fiction ad. But now we live uh, in a science fiction universe and you can't train for these jobs. They're new help wanted ads. So it's sort of like you have to surrender to the change that that can happen as well and be okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time that you're depressed. Yeah. Guy could be depressed. Like I've been doing a podcast for many years. I've been writing similar types of articles for for many many years, running businesses for many years. I always think about change and what could be the change in my life. But you kind of have to sometimes surrender to that uncertainty and and just explore many options. And isn't depression really lack of your expression? Mm. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. I like podcasting so much because I get to watch one of my favorite movies and then just simply call up the movie producer and say, I have a billion questions about the whole process. And I want to ask you, like, how did you get into this? How did you? And then he tells me these amazing stories about his life. So I say, come on the podcast. And he does. So welcome, Scott Steindorf, uh, to the James Altucher show. How's it going? It's going very well. Thank you for having me. And you've done many things and you've had a, a, a kind of a uh, very severe rags to riches story along the way. But the movie I was specifically talking about was Chef, which I just absolutely love. So you like food? Uh, you know, it's not so much that I like food. I, I mean, I, I do like anybody does, but I like, um, it was a very, what I call a choose yourself sort of story. You know, I wrote about this book, Choose Yourself. And of course, why don't you explain the concept of the, of the movie? And then I want to get into your beginnings, which is vastly different from where you are now, but uh, well, explain the concept of Chef. I mean, Chef is about a family, you know, a divorce and a father taking care of his son and how he interacts with his ex-wife. And it's just a, you know, a feel-good movie. And, and there's a real desire, I think, in the marketplace for people who want to go to the movies and escape their lives and have hope for a better life. Well, and it's not, it's not... It's it's the it's the hope for the better life, but it's also the doorway into a new life. So he's a a classically trained restaurant chef, yeah, and has the again a classic argument with the owner of the restaurant, who's the boss, yeah, and he then decides to take his amazing skills at food and cooking and being a chef and and. Go into the leave the restaurant and go into the food truck business after a bad review, and 
the sto- story of how he he reinvented himself. He, he reinvented himself totally <laughs> as a, as a, a food truck connoisseur and, and a food and he, then they and then he and then he uses that's like the vehicle literally by which he rebuilds his relationship with his son and yes, and, I, and I won't get into the end of the story, but it was just such. I've seen the movie three times. It's a beautiful movie. John Favreau, of course, is the star, and he's one of my favorites ever since Swingers. But then. I mean, I was going to ask you this later and, and get into your full story first, but I'll ask you this now. You have this, you had this amazing cast. I mean, John Favreau, Dustin Hoffman, Robert Downey Jr., Scarlett uh, Johansson, uh, Sophie Figuera. How do you get a and and the whole budget for the movie was eleven million dollars? Because do you, John Favreau wrote it, directed it, produced it. They were all his friends. It was a John John Favreau did everything on that movie. It was a very easy movie to be involved with because he's such a genius. So so you basically so he basically says, L- "Listen, don't worry about anything. I'm going to call my friends. They're all in town. It's going to take us an X number of weeks or months to shoot this. You don't need to worry. Just write me a check for eleven million dollars." <laughs> basically, yes. And so you go and raise that money. Correct. Um, where where else in the creative? Pro- I know you're. I know we're going to talk about where you've been heavily involved in the creative process of your movies. But for this one in particular, where else were you involved in the creative process? I mean, I was involved early on, and you know. We- he he did several drafts of the script and the casting, but John did everything on this movie. It was, a, you know, he he's he's a really really hands on director, writer, producer, and and did it with a small crew and a small amount of money, and it it worked. It it's so beautiful on the relationships he has with. I remember I read an interview after I saw the movie where he said he didn't care about the movie critics' reviews. He cared what other chefs felt if this was accurate about what goes on in the kitchen. Yes. And I thought there was a, there's a certain authenticity to that kind of writing and thinking of, of producing a creative product. And he worked as a chef. He trained with some of the best chefs in L.A. and really honed his craft as a chef. So... Yeah, he, it was his passion. And then I guess he he infected these great actors and actresses to with that passion as well. They must have done it for do, how do they make money on a movie like this? Is it all back end or what? Cuz so so just to just to go through the numbers, it was 11 million budget. It, it looked to me like 47 million in the box office. I don't know if that counts international rights and I don't know if the 11 million budget counts marketing. Or no, uh, that uh, that's just the production of of the movie, and the actors participated in the back end, and everybody worked for not much money. So, so, so is it like is it like you all form a company, and you and the actors are owners of that company, and at the end of the day, whatever the profit is, you split up pro rata, compa- depending on your basically your ownership? yes. And and what does the marketing for a movie like that cost? I mean, ten to twenty million dollars. So about a twenty million real budget overall. Yes. And then does the does the box office also include the international rights that you sell? No. no. Or or cable rights? No. So so when it says forty seven million, like on Wikipedia, what's the full revenues on a movie like that, or what do you think it will be in, in at the end of the day? I mean, there's ancillary rights. You sell it to television, pay television. You have DVD sales, you have foreign sales. So, you know, you can, in in today's world, you can cover your budget with ancillary rights, tax deals, tax incentives on where you film it, and foreign sales. I mean, you kind of have the the dream job. You've you've produced, we just said Chef, but also Empire Falls, which won all sorts of awards for for HBO and starring Paul Newman and Ed Harris. Uh, I mean, the casts in your movies are remarkable. The Lincoln Lawyer with Matthew McConaughey, uh, uh, some other ones, Love in the Time of Cholera, uh, The Human Stain, uh, which is uh, based on the book written by Philip Roth, and of course, Love in the Time of Cholera is based on the book written by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You're known as the the Hollywood book guy or book producer because you take a lot of liter- classic literary books and turn them into movies, which is... I think not the main source of box office revenues these days. I think sequels have become the main source of box office revenues. So we'll get into that. Um, but you started off 
essentially from zero in the real estate business 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Yes, <laughs> you're aging me. I'm, I'm aging you. <laughs> oh, well, Scott Steindorf, you're 56 years old. I'm 49. It's, there's no shame in it. We're, 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 we're young at heart. <laughs> so so, so uh, what does it mean you started off in the real estate business? How does that happen? And, and, and then, by the way, you also had severe adversity, which we're going to get into, which I, I, I didn't ask you beforehand if you didn't mind talking about this, but I want to talk about addiction and issues related to that. Yeah, and so on. So okay, we'll get it. there. There's a there's a big gap between real estate and movies, which was your downfall. Yeah. So we're going to get into that. But what what does it mean to get into the real estate business at such a young age? I mean, my father was a real estate developer. You know, we grew up in Minnesota, and then we moved to Arizona when I was fifteen, sixteen, and I grew up. You know, my dad was a real estate developer, so I started working as picking weeds. My first job, I got 50 cents an hour for picking weeds at one of his apartment buildings. Worked my way up, had an understanding of real estate. I was a competitive snow skier, freestyle skier, and I was going to, I I wanted to be an actor. I studied acting and doing theater as a teenager. But by the way, I, I noticed that, uh, and I and I, I'm sorry, Andrew, I'm a little bit of a interrupter when I get curious about something. But I noticed you studied both theater production and real estate. Yeah. So I like how your interests ultimately inter interwove all the way through. Well, I didn't want to study real estate or business. I wanted just to do theater. I wanted to move to Hollywood when I was. I started doing. I was a stunt skier in some movies and commercials, and I wanted to go to Hollywood and and make it as an actor. And I loved the theater, and I loved acting and, you know, movies. And, you know, my father convinced me, you have to study business if you, you know, want to make it in life. So by my father's direction, I took business and theater in college. And then when I got out of, I didn't graduate college because I immediately started doing real estate and I started making a lot of money. So what was the, when you say you started making a lot of money, like what did you do in real estate that was the first thing that was a check in your hand? My first thing in real estate is I started leasing office space in North Scottsdale. And I had several buildings that I was the leasing agent, and I started making really good money back then. So that means someone owned the building. Yes. They gave you like an exclusive right to lease the offices. Correct. Why would they give a kid the exclusive rights to lease the office as opposed to like Caldwell Banker or some real estate agency? They gave it to my father, mm-hmm. who hired me, and I was the leasing agent. So he was experienced, and he was in business with the people that owned the building. So nepotism got me my first job in real estate. As often happens. <laughs> so Donald Trump being another example. Oh, please. <laughs> um, but, you know, I started making money, and I, and I was in, the, in a place in my life that I really wasn't happy with myself, and I, I developed a, a cocaine addiction and alcoholism. Is that because you had... Um, you so you suddenly were like nineteen or twenty years old, and all this money was coming in. I mean, when I was nineteen or twenty, I I had zero money, and I I wasn't working at anything. So it would, it would, I mean, I was in my early twenties, started making money, but I I you know I grew up wanting to be a skier and an actor, and here I was in an office, and I started making money, and I I I mean I I really believe it was because I wasn't my authentic self doing what I really wanted to do in my life and and I started you know becoming addicted and and it destroyed my life I was Well I want to unpack that because I think you you make a, di- a direct connection between um just now you made a direct connection between being your authentic self and uh because you weren't being your authentic self, you needed some almost negative outlet, and that's how this addiction started. Correct. Is that because obviously people take drugs because it feels good at the moment they're taking their drug? Is that because you were kind of craving some sort of feeling that you weren't getting from from your, the satisfaction you, of work? Yes. I mean, I started craving 
that feeling of euphoria and excitement and, and passion for life, which I had when I was skiing or when I was performing. So I got that from cocaine and I didn't want to come down off of it. So I kept doing more and more and more until it almost killed me. And How did it almost kill you? Because I would stop breathing. But I would do such large quantities and I didn't want to come down and I would keep doing it until it, I just, my tongue would go in the back of my throat and I'd stop breathing. And I ended up having to go to the ER several times and I knew that this was life threatening for me. And so. I, so that seems like uh, uh, in, in the midst of all this irrational stuff, a very rational decision. There must be, so you're in the ER, you wake up, say, and the doctors, of course, are looking at you as some sort of, you know, looks of shame. And did you, when did you say, oh, this is not good for me? Because it's hard to make that, 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 have that thought. Well, there was several times and I knew I was a severe addict when after that experience, I would do cocaine after that. And then it, it came to a point where I'm going to die. And I, I just opened up the yellow pages and I found a treatment center in Santa Barbara, California. And I called them and I flew to California and went into rehab. Was, you know, obviously there are rehab centers in Arizona as well. Did you kind of on purpose find a place closer to where your, your, your heart was? Yes. I always loved Southern California. I love Santa Barbara. My parents had lived there for a brief time. And I brought my tennis racket, and I thought I'm going to go t talk to a therapist and get my head together. Now, were your uh, parents supportive of what was happening? What was what was going on? What was the family dynamic? So you see, so you, so you, you, weren't, you weren't just leasing offices. Like, after a while, you were buying and selling, or you were, you were developing properties. At this point, I'm just leasing offices. Mm -hmm. I'm not developing at this point. And what happened was I, my parents didn't know about rehab. They didn't know I had a problem. Nobody knew I had a problem with cocaine because I would do it by myself. It was a very solitary addiction and, and problem in my life. I, I think of cocaine as like uh, a, a party drug. Um, not that I've done this, but actually in this very studio, I had a podcast with a guy, Tony Duff, who wrote a book called The Buy Side about the hedge fund business and how he started getting more and more into cocaine and eventually started doing it by himself. He would basically lock himself in a hotel room and just do it by himself all day. I did it by myself for days at end with nobody around me, no communication. And nobody really knew I had this problem. So when I checked myself into rehab... It was a shock in my family, and in rehab, it probably wasn't the best rehab for my condition because they were dealing more with, sh it was called Schickshadel Hospital, which used aversion therapy to alcohol. Where what they, does that mean? They get you really sick. You have to drink alcohol but not have the effects of the alcohol and then throw up, and they give you a shot of what's called emetine and and you get really sick and you're throwing up from the alcohol. And by the second day there, I said to the doctor, I said, this isn't working for me. I'm a cocaine addict, not an alcoholic. And he said, we'll leave. And so I remember walking to my room and there was a shift in my consciousness. I don't know how it came about. It was my spiritual experience and everything all the stress and pressure just left me. I went to my room. I cried uncontrollably for 24 hours. And from that moment on, I I haven't drank or used for almost 30, 33 and a half years. So so you said all the stress left you. What, is, what does that mean? Because so stress is usually related to, oh, I'm worried that something might happen in the future. So I'm stressed about it. I, th I think it's the pressure of life. I used to always feel that I would, you know, sabotage my own success. I would sabotage who I was, just destructive emotions, bad feelings that I had about myself. They just left me. 
And then I ended up going into a 12 step program and, you know, I've stayed in recovery all these years and it's been my saving grace of my life. Do you still go to meetings? Yes. I still go to four or five meetings a week. Really? And I sponsor a lot of young guys and help them with their addictions and alcoholism. So like you live in LA, but you're visiting New York City this week. That's why we're here in the studio. Are you going to go to physical meetings here in New York City? I was going to go to one last night, but I have to leave tonight. But I will go this weekend where I'm traveling to. I don't know. It does t- do twelve step programs work? I mean, obviously you're going to them, and they they must work to an extent. But I always hear the numbers are something like one out of ten. I I mean, it's I don't, I don't see a lot of people that continue to work the program that are you know in their mid thirties of sobriety, uh, but. People do stay sober, and I think the program works, and I think it's evolving. I think it's changing. I think everything is changing in our society and our world today. And I think there's a point right now where, you know, addiction and alcoholism and all these issues with the brain are, are, we're learning more about it. We're learning how to deal with it. We're learning how to recover from this. And I think it's going to, you know, there's going to be a revolution in recovery. I, I see it. I feel it. Is that because you think, so, so everything's related, related to, we all want to feel this feeling of euphoria, yes. whether it's through work we love yes. or someone we love yes. or a drug. Yes. And drugs are great because you don't have to put in the work or... The, the relationship work, which is, which is difficult. I could just take a pill or whatever and feel great. That's why we live in this o- o- almost this altered consciousness economy that's so enormous. Yes. And uh, do you think what's changing is that maybe there are pills or drugs or antidepressants that are getting healthier? Or do you think internally we're getting, we're able to tap that euphoria in an easier way? I think a lot of it has to do with our emotional well-being, our spiritual well-being, and there's different ways we can recover in those areas in our life. We have meditation, we have yoga, we have exercise, we have eating healthy. You know, it's changing your life to, you know, live a, a more fulfilling life. And it's also the family dynamic is changing. You know, as as you and I, as both of us as divorced dads, have good relationships with our ex-wives, our children are learning healthier kind of relationships. It's about being open emotionally. It's about, you know, spending time for spiritual growth, spending time on what's important in life. And I think that's what's going to change in, in the 12-step programs. I think that's what's making the world change drastically. So, so you're right. There are all these ways in which we're understanding both how physical and mental and emotional health are connected. So for instance, there's a lot of studies that show exercise uh, often is even better than the ba- ba- results of basic antidepressants over a six-month period. Yeah. So, 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 so exercise, sleeping habits, nutrition... All of these things are connect physical, me- emotional, mental health, spiritual health are all connected. Where does the twelve step program fit into that? I mean, the twelve step program is a is a spiritual program, and it's about cleaning up your past and being honest in all your affairs in life, and 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 being your authentic self. I mean, it gets it gets down to who are you, what do you want, where are you going in your life, and how do you feel about yourself. So let's say I'm not in a 12-step program, but I want to understand a little more about what you mean. Um, Who, who, like, what is my authentic self? What kind of self-discovery can I do right now to to ask that question in in a in in a way that has impact? Ask yourself questions. How am I feeling? How do I feel about myself? Do I love myself? Am I feeling guilt about something? Am I feeling shame about something? Am I feeling less than? Am I feeling comfortable with who I am? But let's say people also lie to themselves. So let's say you say to yourself, 
well, I don't want to do real estate. I'm really meant to be an actor. You're asking yourself, who would I, what, do I, what really excites me? And you say to yourself, I'm really meant to be an actor. What if you're just lying to yourself about that? You, you can't lie to yourself. You, you're just denying the truth. So there's a difference between lying to yourself and being in denial. And that's what, you know, an alcoholic or an addict denies he has the problem. Yeah, so it's like a blind spot. That's the problem. Yeah, and and you know, people are just just because this is how the brain works. A blind spot's blind for a reason. People can't see what their blind spots are. How do you start to reframe, almost like reframing the conversation with yourself, so you can start to see what those blind spots are? I, if you're listening to this, you know whatever problem you have is. It's coming to the surface. Don't push it down. Deal with it. So if your problem is relationships, deal with your relationships. Why are you having relationship problems? It's usually something about ourselves and and doing a lot of work on ourselves. I spend, you know, I, 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 I have a three-hour ritual I do every morning. I spend an hour doing cardiovascular I do an hour of meditation and spiritual work, and I have an hour where I try to listen to tapes on improving my life and things that fascinate me. And it makes my life very fulfilling. I wake up at 5.15 in the morning and do this every day. And it's, it's my way of, of trying to get to the truth of who I am because we're constantly changing and growing. Just like the world is changing and growing. I think that's an important point, which is that um, it's not like somebody does a career for 15 years and then reinvents and does a new career for 15 years. I yes. think I think now more than ever, reinvention has to be a habit more than an event. Correct. And and I think that's a hard habit to build uh, because most because we're kind of taught growing up that oh, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to focus and you're going to do the same thing for 60 years and it's what you learned in high school and college and then you're going to get married and have three kids and and then you're going to die. Yes. And and reinvention is not really taught in in that ladder. It's it's kind of this straight ladder to, to heaven. And it, reinvention is not taught along the way. So if you really care about yourself and you start doing this work, you're going to start going back into your childhood and writing about it and discovering what are the things holding you back in the areas that you want to go in? Well, so when you were in the, when you, so, okay, so you, you, you get to your, your room, you cry for 24 hours, you haven't had a drink since then. What happened, though, after that 24-hour period? What did you do first? I started learning about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I started, you know, I admitted I'm powerless over drugs in life, you know, and I need help. And, you know, I had a spiritual experience, which is the third step, and and that then you do an inventory of yourself, find out who you are, where you're at, and I do that every day. And how do you do like like what did you do today? How did you do that inventory? By waking up this morning, you know, I I I worked out for an hour, I I meditated, I did um, my tapes that I'm exploring. Can I ask what tapes? Um, I'm part of a group called Mind Valley, which are meditation and speakers like yourself that are talking about different aspects of life, how you can do better in your financial life, your emotional life. I'm spending a lot of time working on my emotional life because I think that is an area that we disregard. We disregard our emotions and our feelings, and, and it's such an important factor in everything we do. It affects our money. It affects our relationships. It affects our careers. It's the most important thing. It's so true. I can tell you from my own experience, when I've been in a bad relationship, yes. I've lost money. When yeah. I've been in a good relationship, <laughs> I've made money. It's right. like directly correlated. Yes. I don't know which, you know, I don't know, you know, cause and effect, you don't really know. So I don't know if it's losing money puts me in a bad relationship or vice versa, yes. but they are related and connected. It's it, it's so, so true because if 
if if I'm giving you praise and talking about what a great product you have and and we're partners, you're going to go out and feel good about yourself and you're going to feel good about the product and sell the product. And if I'm being really tough and mean and discouraging you, well, then how are you going to feel when you go out to sell the product? Well, well, okay, let me ask you about that. You remember the movie Whiplash with J.K. Simmons yes. and Miles Teller? Yes. So, so just the premise of that movie is J.K. Simmons is this really uh, abusive, kind of borderline crazy drum instructor, jazz drum instructor, and Miles Teller wants to be the best drummer in the world. Yes. And J.K. Simmons tells a story uh, uh, about, I think it's Charlie Parker, where his instructor threw uh, like a musical instrument at him and to, to get him to be better. And if nobody threw that instrument at Charlie Parker in this abusive way, we would have no Charlie Parker who went on to become one of the greatest whatevers of whatever. Right. And so that was his story to, to Miles Teller that I have to be the abusive to get you to perform at your best potential. Is that, do you believe in that no, theory? No, I do not believe in that theory. And, and that's one in 50 million instances where he became a success because of that abuse. But we all want to overcome that abuse or overcome adversity to be where we want to be. And sometimes they're not the best reasons to become successful. We think becoming successful makes us happy. But just because you have a lot of money and financial success doesn't mean your emotional life's in order, your family life's in order. What are the things that are the most important to you in your life? Well, and and uh, I want to get up to um, the story of even a, a year or so ago when you, you had a, a big problem with a movie. Yeah. But you've clearly achieved peak performance in several areas of your life, uh, the first being real estate, uh, so I want to get to that first, which is after you get out of, you know, you start these 12 step programs, you stop taking cocaine. What happens next? Like, obviously you still continued with real estate. You didn't pursue your, your dream yet. So I, I started doing real estate and I was working with my father and because of the dynamics with my father and I, I had a big opportunity to make a lot of money and do a certain real estate project. But it didn't feel right. I just intuitively felt like I need to go do my own thing in life. And I went to my father and I said, Dad, I can't work with you anymore. I need to go off and do my own thing in life. Was he upset? Yes. Did he yell? He didn't yell at me, but he was disappointed. And, and I didn't speak to him for two years. And I went off on my own. I had no money. I had no phone in my little studio apartment. At the time, I had no car, and I went to meetings. I went to two AA meetings a, a day. I started feeling better about myself. I started, you know, thinking, how can I get out of this dilemma? And I started doing some real estate deals on my own. And well, what does that mean? Like, if you have. So 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 let me try to call BS on one thing. You're in your studio apartment, you have no money, but you probably always had the sense that okay, worse comes to worse, I can go back to my dad and do what he wants and make money. I didn't I didn't feel like I had that option. I really didn't feel like I had that option. Like was he not talking to you? Were you not talking to him? I mean, I made a decision not to talk to him, which also made him very angry. So I had no relationship with him. And so, yes, could I have gone and said, Dad, please take me back. And, prodigal son. And groveled on my knees, probably. But that, then I wouldn't have become the person who I became. What does it mean to do a real estate deal with nothing? Like, let's say I have nothing. How do I do... And let's say it's back then, because obviously things changed. But how would I have done I a real estate I went out and deal? found some some properties and and at the time in in Scottsdale and Phoenix Arizona property was really really low the real estate boom hadn't occurred and so one of my first deals was I took a piece of agriculture land went to the owner of the land said I I want to buy your land but I have to rezone it give me some time 
I found an investor for twenty five hundred bucks to tie up that property. So you bought the so the twenty five hundred gave you the option for a certain amount of time to buy the whole property. Yes, and then I rezoned the property to commercial, and then the value went up. How'd you rezone it? Like, did you call the mayor or went <laughs> went to the city and went through the planning and had a this partner who paid for all of that. What if they said no to the rezoning? Then I wouldn't have been able to sell the property. But you had a sense that they would say yes, yes. because you had... So what happened, it, it strikes me that what happened here was, what came first was you had a vision, which yes. is that Scottsdale was somehow going to be a, a more booming town than it was at that time. Yes. Why did you have that vision? I just, I saw growth happening and I had an intuitive feeling that things were going to be taking off and the properties on the outskirts of the city were going to take off. So so the outskirts allowing them to still be cheap because if yes. you bought it inside, if they yes. bought downtown, it would be kind of standard market prices. You wanted to pay a cheap price. Right. So you found a farmer who probably didn't understand the same vision and he was just sitting on this farm that wasn't doing anything. Yes. And uh, he figured, oh, this guy's going to offer me a decent price. Yes. And... For well, him, he it got a decent, a decent price. Right. But he thought it was a fair price. The property was actually in Phoenix, not Scottsdale. But it was a, you know, it was farm property and I rezoned it and the value of that property went way up. And so it, just the rezoning itself made yes, the property go up. Yes. So so did you have did you w- did you buy the property in full before the rezoning happened? Or yes. Did, okay. So you had a sense, though. You were, you were already in discussions. You had a sense the rezoning was going to happen, and that's when you executed your option. Correct. Because you probably were nervous maybe he'd back out of the option, yes. even if he was legally required to do it. Yes. There's always that paranoia. Yes. So, you know, I was able to sell that property in a very short time for a lot of money. So uh, and then I started doing more of that. I started because it scales. You could just yes. keep on doing. So so so, how much altogether did you put into that investment? How did you raise the money, and how much did you make? Again, I put twenty five hundred dollar option, and you know I had a partner, but I think you know this is going back many years. But I think we made six hundred thousand dollars on your first deal. It wasn't. I mean, I had done little deals up to that, but yeah. In my first year of sobriety, I I became a millionaire in my first year of sobriety. That's unbelievable. So that's thirty years ago. So what, that's like ninety five years ago. Since nineteen eighty two years ago. Yeah. Uh and how old were you then? In my twenty four, twenty three. Oh man, I'm I feel 24. like a little jealous here. <laughs> so so you're twenty four. And I start making a lot of money. And now I'm able to scale it up. I'm helping other people. Are you able to scale it because you still have a vision that nobody else quite has caught up with yet? Like you, you're, you were slightly ahead. Scottsdale and Phoenix are going to be boom towns. And let's buy the exurbs of these and I, towns. I, and I wanted to start building shopping centers. So I started helping other developer who was doing shopping centers. I started learning about retail about shopping centers, so I started being able to have some intellect about that space. And so in a very short time, I was scaling it up. But I wanted to be creative. So I wanted to do what I was calling them retail entertainment centers. So I wanted to, what that entailed back then was you know, they had food courts, they had interesting dynamics about them, and, and you know, I, I was trying to think of ways that I could be creative in designing. I loved designing buildings, I loved architecture. My dad was a, you know, also designed his own homes and properties. So I, from an early age, I loved the design aspect. It started off with a, a somewhat unique vision, unique in the sense that if everybody had it, then prices would have been going up too fast for you. Um, then you had a kind of a, a, a you, you sort of knew from your growing up and everything what has to happen. Okay, we're going to rezone. We're going to at least attach developers to a property so that other investors could see what's happening, and then the value goes up. But then you had a further vision, which is that. Uh, spaces in the exurbs, the suburbs of these boom towns, need to have a little more to them than just being a shopping strip. 
Uh, they have to have they have to be a space at the community. It has to replace the village downtown, the the the, the, the town center. Yeah, you you kind of have to do that for the suburb. Yes, and that seemed like a unique thing in Arizona at the time. Yes, is my and guess. then I started trying to buy property in downtown Scottsdale to build a big entertainment center in the center of town, which it ended up being like a hundred million dollar project. But I sold the land. And I made money selling the land to the project. Because you were able to, again, get the land, um, start moving in the direction of the vision until other people saw it, the yes. property went up, and yes. boom, things happened. Yes. And at the same time, you were, you, were able, you were getting your creative outlet as opposed to just leasing offices you were, you, you, where, where your outlet for euphoria became the drugs. You, you, were, you, you identified, okay, I need to be creative or else I'm going to possibly slip back or something bad will happen. Yeah. And and you were able to identify how to be creative in what you were doing, regardless of what you were doing. Yes. And then I started building shopping centers and and you know, I was married. I had three small children. I started building a life and 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 I was happy at the time with that life. And then for a period. And then what happened? Because <laughs> obviously things drastically changed. I mean, after seven or eight years, the market crashed, and so the real estate market just collapsed. Did you have a sense uh, beforehand? Like, were you were you leveraged to the hilt when it crashed, or what was what was going on? How did you de- protect your risk during this period? I didn't protect my risk. I got crushed, and it devastated me, and and i didn't know how to deal with it were you cuz uh, i was still young right and you had three kids and i had three small kids and your your self worth was probably tied up with your net worth a little bit is my guess yes my self worth was all in my net worth and so and it really wasn't what i wanted to do so i i decided to make a change and and move to you know malibu california and did you? My kids, two. My third kid wasn't even born yet. I had two kids. They were small children. We moved to Malibu. We didn't have much money, and because all this money from the real estate had been tied up in properties, yes. and just gone. Yes, and so I went there, and and struggled, you know, and suffered. But I wanted to be a writer. Again, I brought my tennis racket. And I wanted to go on the beach and and write movies and write TV shows, and that's the life I wanted. And yeah. and it wasn't in it didn't just come to me. Hollywood didn't open their doors and say, "Thank God, Scott Steindorf's here." <laughs> well, like what happened? So you, you did you start writing? Were you able to write a screenplay? I started writing a lot. Uh-huh. I started writing. I was always a writer as a kid. And it was always something I intuitively knew I was going to do at a certain time. And and so I, I started writing, getting rejected, writing, getting rejected, writing, getting rejected. What was like a sample thing you wrote? Um, I was writing about, you know, a story about addiction. My, my first script that I saw was a, a story about a guy that has an addiction problem and meets a, a boy and his relationships, and I sold the script. Who, who, how, how, do you, um, how did you know where to go to sell this? Like, a lot I, of people in L.A. are writing scripts. Like, what did you do to— Because my advantage all in my Hollywood career has been one thing. I had business experience. I was taught business by my father— I went off and I was dealing with a lot of very, very powerful business people. I was really young and I learned a lot from these people. So I imagine a lot of, um, there's probably overlap in the real estate world and Hollywood because the the money to make movies has to come from somewhere. And if there's any boom anywhere, some of that money is going to flow into Hollywood. Yes. And is that, did you kind of flow in those connections as well so you can get in the right door? Yes. But, you know, how I made it in real estate is cold calling. Mm -hmm. Get on the phone and just start calling a lot of people. And how I made it in Hollywood is get on the phone and start calling a lot of people. But, like, who would you call? Why would they see you? I would call everybody because most people wouldn't take my call. Most people wouldn't take my script. But but everyone's calling. I would imagine they're all calling. They're Steven not Steven Spielberg but, saying. But, but, Look but at if my you're script. making a hundred calls a day and one person answers and says, "Send your script over," so 
I, I knew from my business experience how to get indoors. And again, I still struggled and suffered a lot. And, and that's how I think I ultimately broke down the door. So, so, okay. So in real estate, when you're cold calling, are you cold calling property owners trying to buy their property? Yes. And you're calling potential investors to raise money? Yes. So with the, with Hollywood, who who were you calling? Were you calling? I was calling the studios. I was calling agents. I was calling production companies. I was starting to meet people because I lived in Malibu. I was I was doing whatever it took to try to make a living. And so, from the time you first moved to Malibu to the time you got the first one dollar bill yeah. for something you you did creatively, how yes. much time took place? I mean, probably five or six years. Five or six years. Okay. I think five years is like for a, for a career transition. I think five years is sort of like the, almost like the rule. Yes. And I was doing consulting with real estate. I started getting back on my feet in the real estate world. I started doing business consulting with gyms. I started. Well, why tr- gyms? Because, you know, my family also had been in the gym business and I had built some, some shopping centers with gyms. So I knew some something about that business. And and so I started doing business consulting to make a living. And, and I'm sorry I ask questions on, on tangents, but I just get really curious. So you go to, you see a kind of gym that might be starting up. Maybe yeah. you have a sense that it's struggling because of your experience. Yeah. What do you do? You go inside and say, hey, if you did X, Y, and Z and I could help you do that, your gym will, will outperform. Yeah, I can help you build membership. Like what would be a typical wrong thing a gym would do? Mostly what a gym doesn't do is have membership and they don't know how to train their salespeople to do membership. I see they they have walk-ins but no membership. Yeah, so it's cold calling. Mm -hmm. I know about going out there and drumming up business. And so that's what I was getting paid to do to support my family. And it was struggle. So so again, you, you, you would cold call gyms. Or yes. you would, and I would call or go in there and say, hey, I have experience. Here's my experience. This is what I think you can do with your gym. And they might say, okay, we'll pay you 2000 a month. You come in and, and consult for us. Yes. And you had like a bunch of gym clients like right. this. And did, they, did your consulting experience work for them? Did they, yes. did they do well? Yes. And then I started doing real estate consulting and helping people with their real estate problems where, is, where you can make real money. But... How I broke into show business is also now that we're talking about all this is how I really broke into show business is that I I wrote a script. It was based on a Tom Tryon book that I optioned myself called Night Magic. And I I wrote the script and and I ended up selling that script a couple of times. Because they buy the option, the option they would out. option and the option would lapse, and I didn't make big money, but you know, twenty five, fifty thousand an option. Look, that's great for for Back writing. Back then, it yeah. was was a lot of money, and and then, but it was a really good sample of writing, and it was a story about a magician who is in love with a young girl here in New York, and and she or he meets somebody that can teach him real magic, real power. So it was a really symbolic story for me. Will you choose money and power over love? And that was the essence of the story. You know what? That We're going to get back to that theme because yes, that, co- <laughs> that comes through <laughs> in a lot of your movies. But, 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 but you... This is what I always find in, in interviews and sometimes people criticize me for interrupting but the things that seem easy for you seem really difficult for me and I want to know more about so 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 you skip right over the point like oh you bought you 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 read this book and you bought the rights and you wrote the script for it it's a lot of things that happen there right. like you read a book that so you liked so I had a, a friend of mine who invested option the the book for me but how did you even contact the author and say hey I want to option your book I cold called so, so if I read a book that I like, yes, I could potentially cold call the writer, yes, and say, "Hey, your book's ranked a million on Amazon, so no one's reading it." Yes, I'm going to option your book for a thousand bucks or yes. ten thousand bucks, whatever Correct. it is. 
Go for it. So, so take a risk. I mean, go out there. You, it's not going to come to you. You have to go make things happen. So, so you optioned first, and and he was happy because probably nobody else was optioning his. Well, book. it had been optioned before Tom Cruise had optioned it before the option lapse. He had died. Tom Tryon had died, and his partner. I became friends with just coincidentally. His sister lived in Malibu. So I went to meet him and convinced him to give me the rights. He gave me the rights. I gave him some money. Okay, if I were him, I I would say, listen, Tom Cruise was the last guy optioning this. I'm going to just go to David Geffen and have him figure it out. Yes. (laughs) Or or Michael Ovitz and have him figure it out. He had that option, but I convinced him to go with me. How did you convince him? I convinced him through passion, how much I loved the book and what I thought the story meant and, and how I could make it happen. So that's half of the convincing. The other half has to be you telling me, I think I have a decent chance of making the, getting that movie made when, yes. when you have never made a movie before at yes, that point. How did you do that convincing? I have no idea why he gave me those rights. I, I did so good on the convincing of the first part that he bought into the second part. I guess he felt you were so passionate because my about passion, the story. Yes. You would be able to convince the next Tom Cruise, hey, get involved with me. Yes. And it was just an option anyway. Yes. So it would lapse at some point. Yes. And you convinced someone to invest in with you? And I became friends with him. I mean, he actually, um, unfortunately, he passed away, but he was a really good person, and and he gave me a big break, and, and I appreciate it, and I'm so, grateful for it. That was probably the first uh, real... Um, I, I, don't wanna, I don't know if I had, a, had other scripts option, but not for... You know, I ended up doing a deal with Don Johnson and Reicher Entertainment. I think they optioned it for 50000 bucks. That script? Yes. And then Tom Cruise's company wanted to do it at one point, And another company out of Italy optioned it for fifty or 60000 bucks. So I guess your in back in with Tom Cruise was, hey, you've already optioned the book. Now I have the script yes. and the option. Yes. Let's at least have a meeting. Yes. And did you meet, you didn't meet him, but you met his producing partner? Correct. Um, I forgot what her name was. Uh, Paula Wagner. Is, is that who you met? Yeah. And, uh, and were they excited? Did they? I mean, they were considering it for a while. Did they and like the script? And then I ended up, they liked the script, and then I ended up selling it to a company out of Italy, Eagle Films. And did they end up ever making the movie? No. But I, I'm going to tell you what happened and how that became my calling card in Hollywood is that I I ended up one day um, amicably sitting down with my ex-wife going, this isn't working. and And we both agreed that we need to move on. And so I left our place in Malibu and I'm like, I have no idea where I'm going. I have no idea where I'm going to live. You have half your money or less. Yes. (laughs) And, and I'm driving. And I remember because back then we had the big cell phones. You remember the, the giant cell phones and one of my college roommates was part of the Starwood company. And he said, what are you doing? I go, I just got divorced. I don't know what I'm doing, where I'm going. He goes, we just bought Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. And I go, that's great. And he goes, come up here. We don't know what we're doing, so maybe you can help us. So I I literally drove that day to Las Vegas, and I stayed at Caesar's Palace. And I became a consultant to Caesar's Palace on entertainment. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So Caesar's Palace, obviously, at one point was a first-tier Las Vegas casino. They understood entertainment. They understood the concept of making an entertainment space. Yes. Presumably, your roommate was Starwood was a a leverage buyout type of guy because Caesar's was probably in in massive debt, and they just bought out the debt. What were you adding to the picture? To uh, they already understood entertainment spaces because next to Caesar's Palace was the Forum Shops. And the Forum Shops was developed by Mel Simon, who was a shopping center developer, who was my mentor in the shopping center space. 
So they had all those talking statues and they were building a new um, Atlantis theme in the back of the forum shops. And so Caesar's Palace, Mel Simon, and IMAX were all combined in trying to get people to go back. And they they were having problems with the creative elements of this of this attraction. Like what? There was no script and they were talking, you know, statues. And so they hired me to be the creative consultant to try to fix the Atlanta show. The IMAX had an Atlanta show, and Caesars owned all this stuff. Really, Mel Simon, ultimately, that clinched the deal for me, and he cared about me. So, you know, he knew I had just gotten divorced, and so they gave me an opportunity. And then everybody wanted me to fix things. And then Caesars had Caesars Magical Empire, and they wanted to redo it, so I created plans to redo it. David Copperfield, they were having issues with his contract and show. So I got involved with that. So I was doing, you know, the billboards, bringing Coca-Cola to the billboard. I was doing all these creative things and having the time of my life. From the time Rain Man was shot at Caesar's Palace. Did you bring Rain Man to Caesar's think, Palace? No, Rain Man was shot before I got okay. there. But it, so it was, it was a lot of fun because I could be creative. And... And so, so it was satisfying that need. It you didn't, was satisfying. You didn't feel like you had to go to Hollywood right away at that point. Yeah, and so you know, I'm I'm staying in a nice suite in Caesar's Palace. That's my home. I don't drink or party. I'm being productive. Was that hard at that point? Because there's so much like just free alcohol and and no, I bad lost, behavior. <laughs> I lost the obsession to drink and use drugs early on, so I didn't have any of that. And they built a a Buddhist temple outside of Caesar's Palace. So I used to go meditate with real Buddhist monks outside of Caesar's Palace. So it got me through a very hard year of my life, you know, learning Buddhism and meditation. I want to unpack that a little bit because <laughs> because it was a very hard year for your life, but also you you that's a little bit of a contradiction with the what you, word you used earlier. You said it amicably ended with your wife. So right. So... What's what's the disconnect there? Because you're feeling terrible about being away from your children. Mm. It's a terrible, terrible thing. It's the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life as a divorce. And it's not so much your wife, it's your relationship with your children. I could 100% relate to that when I got divorced. The one thing I kept thinking about was... <laughs> When my daughter would wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare, I could calm yes. her down and be yes. there for her while she was crying. Yes. And I kept imagining I'm no longer going to be able to to do that. Yes. And that was very sad for me. And you miss the baseball game, and you miss the volleyball game, and you miss the horse riding, and you miss the dance class, and you feel terrible, and you cry, and... And, you know, you never get those years back, no. right? So how and do you... you always feel bad. I mean, I've had to come to terms with my children on some of this stuff recently because I need to unload it. Do, do they resent it at all? No. They don't even remember. They just had their life and they were doing it. They yes. had their friends. Yeah. You know, that's what we don't realize. They have their life yes. that they're doing. And we're, at some point, we're only a small part of their life. Yeah. It's like an evolutionary thing. They have to stop bonding with their old parents who can't join them in the hunt and they bond with their peers. It's like it's like their their hormones are like forcing them to bond more with their peers. Yes. I mean it's our self-centered fears. Yeah. And it's about us and and they are like what are you talking about dad? And it's things that you cry yourself to sleep with feeling guilty and shame about and No, it's really true. And and so and none of this drove you. So, like you said, the meditation drove, uh, helped you uh, deal yes, with that. Yes, and going to meetings and doing my program. But what happened when I was at Caesar's Palace, and this is my big turning point in my career, is MGM had a show, and it was a $65 million show. It was called the EFX show. 
And they had hired Michael Crawford from uh, Phantom of the Opera to be the star of it. They spent $65 million. It was the most expensive live show anywhere in the world. And I went to the show and I saw the show and it was a disaster. It, it wasn't working. What, what made you, what was the first thing that you saw that said, oh my God, this is not working? I couldn't hear the actor. There was technical problems. Some of the, they had, you know, dragons coming out. They had, it, it's a story of a boy, you know, on a, on a journey through H.G. Wells and, and Houdini and all these, you, you know, P.T. Barnum, all these great things that I love, but it just wasn't connecting. There was no emotional connection to the show. And so I sat next to somebody that worked at MGM and he, he looked at me at the end of the show and said, what do you think? I says, it's a disaster. And the next day they had reviewed the show in the Las Vegas paper and gave it like a D minus. And, and so they wanted to redo the show. So I called that executive and I said, I know how to fix it. And so come on in. So I went in and I said, this is what you need to change in the show. And I gave them all my ideas and I gave them my script, Night Magic. So you gave them the ideas essentially for free. They weren't paying you. You were kind of... You were I was trying to get a job to right. redo their show. Right. So And, 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 the, and the problems range from... from it wasn't just uh, the story. It's stuff also that you had experience with because of real estate. There was technical issues. There was the yeah. way the thing was built and, and so on. Yes. And so they were really interested... And and then they and you proved to them that you were a writer as well. So you 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 had a, a sold script in Hollywood. Well, MGM was interested in Night Magic at the time, so mm -hmm. I gave them that script that I could really write. So I they said we're going to be back to you in a week because we're hiring some new people here, and 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 so. I didn't hear from him in a week. And at that point, I was in another turning point where I needed to reinvent myself because Caesars had just sold, Starwood had sold Caesars. Mm. So now it was like, okay, there's no more work for me here. Should I go back to Hollywood? Should I go do real estate with Starwood? You know, should I go try to make movies? Wh what is it I should do? And so... My room was up at Caesars. It was a Sunday night. And so I was very depressed. I was very uncertain about my future. And I get in my car and I'm driving to LA. And outside of Vegas, there's an area called Prim and there's a hill. And my car doesn't go up the hill. So I back down into Prim, try it again. My car overheats, I go back down. And then so I eat dinner there, try it again. It still won't do it. But somehow I go back to Caesar's Palace. It makes it all the way back. And I get back there and I get my same room back. And at 8.30 in the morning, the MGM exec says, we just hired Broadway legend Tommy Toon to do the show. Can you be here in an hour? because he's going to meet writers. We have writers coming in, you know, from Hollywood and from Broadway. And I said, I'll be right over. You must have been thinking, I'm going to go in this room. Tommy Toon's a legend. He's going to bring, he, he's going to bring in his network of contacts where we'll all be legends, yes. and there will be me. I didn't even think of any of that because it happened so fast. Okay. And I was just kind of shocked that I got the phone call. And all weekend, I was reading a book, a spiritual book by James Allen, who as wrote, a man thinketh, as a man thinketh. But there was it was actually my ex wife gave it to me, and it was a it it was it was five of his books all put into one. So it was a, a, a it was a spiritual journey in the book. And so I go meet Tommy Toon. I'm the first guy to meet him. And there's literally, I can see writers waiting. We're in the theater. And so I sit down with him and he goes, what do you think the show should be? And I go, it should be a spiritual journey of this boy 
you know, going through these experiences of being P.T. Barnum, being Houdini, being H.G. Wells, so that he's experiencing these things from a spiritual standpoint and an emotional growth standpoint. And I started pitching aspects of the James Allen book. And, you know, the MGM execs kept on interrupting and saying, Tommy, you have, you know, all these appointments are waiting. And Tommy goes, no, I've decided I want to hire Scott. Wow. And so he hired me to, to write it. There was no director. There was no producer. So I was playing every hat. And they shut down the show for 10 months. And so for 10 months... I created this show. Um, That's enormous. You created a $65 million show. Well, it was already (laughs) created, so I don't want to take credit for what I didn't do, but I created the new story, you know, that several artists ended up playing. It ran for seven years, and it was a real fulfilling experience as a writer, you know, to see your your show live. and, And, you know, when... When things didn't work, you would fix dialogue, and this isn't funny, and this isn't feeling, and this isn't working. And I also was working with Tommy Toon, who, you know, to me is still one of the greatest artists I worked with. Like, what did you learn from him about story? What's like one thing? Because he was all about emotional truth, just like Paul Newman was. It's all about the emotional truth of what the character is doing. So that's why he was probably so attracted to your idea of this character as opposed to like, let's put him on an adventure or let's, uh, yes. you know, not not so much plot driven, but like, let's take the audience on this spiritual journey. The, the character needed to connect with the audience is what he said. I think also it's interesting that you were depressed. So yes. here you had gone from success to success to success. So real estate, then you uh, you get to Hollywood, you option a, a movie, then you get to Caesar's Palace and you turn it around. But at the end of it all, it's still like we we always have to find the next thing. Yeah. Um, and the next thing, uncertainty itself is scary, but but we always have to face it to to grow. Right. And and you, if you didn't have uncertainty in your life, if you said, okay, well, I was good at this Caesar's Palace thing, so I'm going to stay at Star Wars the rest of my life and help them with their next 10 projects, you wouldn't have had this kind of um, trifecta of uncertainty about which direction to go. You wouldn't have... People could say, oh, you got lucky. You ended up back at Caesar's Palace. You read the right book. You met the right guy. You were the first one there. But you kind of create your luck, you know, by sort of cultivating the uncertainty and and being in the right nobody's ever in the right place at the right time without the right reason is right. is the third part they forget well you it it's intuition and having a feeling which is true to yourself so it's constantly taking this inventory it's constantly knowing who you are what you're seeking and if you're in tune with yourself you're in tune with the world and if you're in tune with the world, you know what's out there for you to contribute to the world. But I, but I think that that almost makes it sound easier than it is because I think when you really well, it's are, not easy at all. You have to do all the legwork right. to get there. Because like like but like in any situation, I mean, we live in in a world where things are changing now. Industry is is being upsized now on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, the other day I saw. Uh, a help wanted ad for a self-driving car engineer, right? <laughs> so, so like five years ago, that would have been like an ad out of Blade Runner or something, like a science fiction ad. Yeah. But now we live uh, in a science fiction universe. Like these ads are, you, you, and you can't train for these jobs. They're they're, they're new help wanted ads. Right. So, so it's sort of like you have to be surrender to the change that that can happen as well, and be okay with it. Yes. Yeah, at the same time that you're depressed. Like, yeah. I could be depressed. Like, I've been doing a podcast for many years. I've been writing, you know, similar types of articles for, for many, many years, you know, running businesses for many years. I always think about change and what could be the change in my life. But you kind of have to sometimes surrender to that uncertainty and, and just explore many options. And isn't depression really lack of your expression? Mm. Yeah, so, I never thought of it that way. So, being depressed is I'm not able to express myself. So mm. if 
and then I get inward and depressed and uncomfortable and have fear and anxiety, what am I going to do? Well, I need to go express myself. Well, okay, so we're we're on the verge now where you then begin this career of expressing yourself in this very public and visible and exciting way with movies and in Hollywood. But I want to address that one thing, depression versus expression. Um, let's talk about relationships. Yes. Oftentimes, people are depressed because they feel they're in the wrong relationship, but this is a this might be a blind spot. <laughs> they might be in the right relationship and depressed for the wrong reason. Correct. Because people maybe are attracted to someone not good for them or they don't know what they want. I think often I think most people just don't know what they want. But it it's getting in touch with who who you are. And if you get in touch with who you are and do an inventory of who you really are, then you're able to decipher and feel good about yourself. The key is you have to heal those wounds. We all have wounds. I don't care if you're, you know, it's easy to say, well, he's an addict and he's an alcoholic. Of course he has wounds. We all have wounds. Every hu We're all human beings. We have all sorts of wounds. So it's healing those wounds. And I'm continuing, I, I constantly find new wounds that I didn't know existed in me. And when I find those wounds, I have to deal with them and heal them so I can be freer myself. Like, what's an example? You're, you're 56 years old with massive successes behind you. What's a recent wound you have found and worked on healing? I was listening to this tape two days ago, and, and it's about, do you value money? Where in your life did you not value money? And all of a sudden, I have this vision not vision, a memory of me at the age of eight and I had bought a piece of lead from a boy in school for two bucks and my father said, you paid $2 for that piece of lead? That came from my construction site. You don't value money. Hmm. So instantly, I realized I didn't value money at the age of eight and I got scolded for it and I got that angry response about it and so I was able to look at that and heal that part of myself so it's the same in relationships how did you work about think about healing it just by aware, awareness becoming aware be, I mean self-awareness is the key to success in all areas of our life so now I'm aware of it and now I can go oh there's different areas in my life different times in my life where I didn't value money where I should have. And, and again, uh, self-awareness is not just meditation or yoga no. or nutrition or 12-step. You 12 have to step. do the work. Yeah, it's, it's, a com it's a combination of your, your brain doesn't care about self-awareness. Something else inside of you has to care about it. And yes. So that's why it's hard work because yes. it's not about survival. It's different. It's a different skill set than what we kind of were evolved to be. Yes. It's about emotional well-being, and and you have to do a lot of work on it. And so the other thing I want to unpack in your uh, experience of this MGM show is uh, a lot of times people say to me, oh, I had that idea, or oh, I said that to you already. Or, or but, but what you did was you had this idea, this show is, is a disaster, then you said the words, this show is a disaster to someone who had power and, and impact. And then you actually did something. You went to a meeting, you showed a script, you came back for a second meeting, you pitched an idea, and then you wrote a new script, presumably. Yes. And so, so I always kind of say this over and over again to myself. Actions are more important than words are more important than thoughts. It's easy to have thoughts. And it's good to have good thoughts, but ultimately you have to start translating it into and developing the skill to translate it into action, which is what you were repeatedly doing through, through all of these things. Yes. And also at the time, now that we're talking about this, I'm becoming more aware of myself, is that I was making a living at fixing problems. Mm. So I would... Take the gyms, for example. The gyms were troubled and having difficulty. I was aware of their problems 
and I was able to identify what their problems are and fix them. Right, or a, a real estate project. I was doing several real estate projects as a consultant and go, this is why your project's not working. Let's change this, 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 and this. So I was the fix-it guy. And you, and, and you had the language of fixing. So yes. let's say as opposed to other writers that might have been in the room, they might have had the 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 language of the arc of a story, but they didn't necessarily have the full vocabulary of how we fix this very complicated show. Correct. Which which you did because of your interweaving experiences. Correct. So so I think it's it's an important thing that people should understand that it's not about one skill set you develop. It's about how you kind of meld these skill sets into your own unique yes. view of yourself yes. and then act on it. Yeah, I have very few skills in life, but I can apply them. No, I, I can relate. I, I think I have very few skills in life. We all have very few skills. There's only so many skills. There's only so many things you can put your 10,000 hours into, right. or 5,000, or 2,000, or however many hours. But then there's the skill set of combining them, right. which, which makes you unique then. Correct. So you were the writer who also could fix gyms. Yes. <laughs> and that <laughs> turned into a, a very turning, that turned into a, that combination of skill sets created a turning point for you. Right. And if you didn't take that turning point, there might have been, or probably would have been another one, but that was the one you, you took. And so late in life, I have come to the fact of, you know, I can fix other people's problems. I need to fix my problems. So it's becoming the fix-it guy for me. You know, we need to be constantly fixing ourselves and trying to be a better Scott. On a daily basis, I you can't ever stop. You can't ever say, "Oh, that's it. I'm yes. done. I did what I wanted. Now I can just cruise on out." Right. It's like you know the days of, you know, I'm going to have two kids. I'm going to work my job. I'm going to retire at 55. I'm going to play golf. No, life doesn't work that but way I, anymore. I think that's why those generations became so disconnected from the generation after them is because right. they sort of stopped yes. while their kids were sort of absorbing the new world. I mean, I hope I am able to always connect with my kids in some way that my parents or their parents weren't able to connect with them. Yes. And and so that's if we're constantly relearning and learning new things and growing and changing and becoming aware of ourselves. And that's one of the beauties of the 12-step program for me is that you're constantly doing an inventory of where you're at. Because drinking and doing cocaine was such a small percentage of my life. And I'm a human being. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. And I have made a lot of mistakes. Oh, we're, gonna, we're still going to get to them. I know we've yes. been talking for a while. but So now we're finally, <laughs> you're, you're writing, you're, you're seeing your writing on stage, which must have been a, a wonderful experience yes. and getting good reviews. And, yes. and you could have probably just, again, stayed in Las Vegas forever writing shows and being that guy. I wanted to stay in Vegas and keep writing shows and be that guy. But there weren't a lot of opportunities for shows at the time. And then I came to New York and I took meetings here and there wasn't a I mean, Broadway was soft back then. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go make movies. And I made a, a very conscious decision. I'm going to buy the rights to books to make into movies. So that was your thing, as opposed to saying, I'm going to make Superman 4 and put together the the deals for that. You weren't right. like a purely a deal guy. You wanted to um, uh, find a story you loved, but you didn't want to write your own unique story first either. No. You want, you had you had your, your, your thing. You wanted to find a beautiful book that nobody was maybe an undiscovered farm somewhere, right. you know, in your real estate parlance, and buy the rights to that and then work those deals and that magic. Yes. And so I, I loved reading books. I grew up reading books. And I wanted, I always thought the best movies were based on books. So it's I. Like, made, what were your favorite uh, movies at that time? Um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I loved Paul Newman and Robert Redford, The Sting. I loved um, Dr. Zhivago. I love the sound of music. My father loved movies, and we would actually go to the theater time after time after time. I saw, you know, Dr. Zhivago probably 11 times as a kid. Hmm. I probably have seen the sound of music 
40, 50 times in my life. Mm -hmm. So those great classic movies. And I remember at the age of 19 making a decision, I want to make a movie with Paul Newman. And we will fast forward to that in a little bit because Empire Falls, Paul Newman, excellent performance. Um, did he win uh, and get an Emmy nomination for that, right? He or, won the Emmy. He won the Emmy. And he won the Golden Globe. And me and my fellow producers won the Golden Globe for best miniseries. So I want, I want to talk about that and particularly Paul Newman's performance in a second. But, okay, so now you go back to Hollywood. What, what, what book did you buy the rights to? What was your first... Uh, Thing. I mean, the bigger ones, the first big one was um, Philip Roth's book, The Human Stain. So so Philip Roth must have people chasing him all day long. How did yeah. you kind of run into the older, uh, experienced Philip Roth and say, hey, let me do The Human Stain for you? I think he was so fast. I mean, the his agent put me on the phone with him. Why? I just kept on pounding on the agent that I wanted to make this movie. And and I'll tell you, nobody was, there wasn't a lot of people pounding on his door because the galleys didn't go out. For some reason, Hollywood at that time, 2001, 2002, wasn't buying a lot of books. And, you know, prior to a book's publication, they sent galleys out. And some reason, that book didn't send the galleys out. And, and by the way, I don't know of any Philip Roth book other than that book that became uh, a movie. Did Goodbye, uh, no. did Portnoy's Complaint become a movie? No. Um, Goodbye, Columbus is a short story collection. Uh, any Lake of his Zuckerman? Shore, yeah, Lakeshore did a couple of his movies. They were smaller movies. But, you know... He, so I get on the phone with Philip Roth, and he he was enamored by my experience in Vegas. I could tell he was, like, really curious about Las Vegas. What's it like? He was asking me a million questions. He didn't ask me anything about how I wanted to make his movie. Why was and he, he had never been to Las Vegas. He had never. Did he want to write a book about Vegas or something? I never asked him why he was so curious. And the second time I talked to him, again, it was a million questions about wow. us. What do you think it was? I think he was interested in writing about it. Huh. And so they ended up giving me the rights. And, you know, it was a very short time from the time I optioned it until we made the movie. Probably a year and a couple months. That seems unbelievable, actually. Yeah. Was this the first book I, during this period that you had option? Like, yes. just, just going from option to green light to movie seems like pretty incredible. What it do you, was really fast. What do you attribute the speed to? There was a lot of interest from actors to, and directors. Because, because they felt like, uh, like there's this whole thing, the actors do one for them, one for me. Yes. And so was this the one for me that they all felt? like? Yes. And Philip Roth was a potential Nobel well, Prize Newman, winner. Paul Newman called me uh, on my cell phone. I don't know how, to this day how he got my number. And he wanted to play that part. When you picked up when you picked up the phone and he said, This is Paul Newman, did you recognize kind of that I that knew. velvet voice yes. that he has? Yes. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. And I was just thrilled out of my mind, you know, that Paul Newman wanted to play this part. But we put the movie together really, you know, really fast for a book. And there were every actress in Hollywood wanted to play the Nicole Kidman part. And it was easy to cast, and you know I'm proud of the movie. Who 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 directed it? Ro um, Robert Benton. And did did you help with the script? Yes. And did you get a uh, credit on the script? No. So you were basically putting together all the people, the deal, the. the I did it with Lake Shore, Tom Rosenberg. And because you brought the concept to everybody, you were able to be more involved in the creative process. Your yes. your vision kind of started the creative engine. Yes. So so how did that one do? It did okay. I think that one made a little bit, right? But we sold, it did really well overseas, and we covered the budget overseas, and it did well. Did that help? So that was your first experience making a movie with that quality of cast and ever being involved in a movie of that quality. Yeah. Did that cement your relationships with studios, with actors, with directors, and so on? Like were, were you starting to take lunches at the Ivy and, and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> I'm not an Ivy kind of guy. I'm still 
Scott Steindorf from Stillwater, Minnesota, country boy, you know. I, I've never been... Actually, you know, Hollywood has a thing about taking lunches from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And I used to joke in my office, that's the time I would be calling New York to try to get the next book. Because, you know, in New York, it's 11, 12, 1, so I felt I was beating the competition by working lunches. You've done how many movies altogether? It's around 10, maybe more? Yeah. So so one of the more well-known ones is uh, uh, Love in the Time of Cholera, obviously yes. a, a brilliant book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, author of 100 Years of Solitude. Yeah. Uh, I read a story that you pursued him because... Uh, and you doggedly pursued him saying you were like Florentino, the main character of Love in the Time of Cholera. Yes. And so so what was that like? How did, he, how did you win him over? I mean, you know, I read Love in the Time of Cholera and I fell in love with the book and I, I related to the character of Florentino. You know, and I just thought I need to make this movie. There's, I, I just was at a place where I was really aggressively wanting to I think I was trying to find the truth of myself, of that character, of love. So I was trying to answer questions that I had about love. And so I really sought him out. It, it's so interesting because, I mean, without going too much into the, the weeds on that book, um, there's no real answers there. And I think that part <laughs> of the beauty of that book is that, you know, the pain of love like cholera is a confusing disease yes. with no real cure. Yes. And you see that from all of the main characters, and maybe that's what attracted you to it, is that there's a, a big uncertainty in, in love there. Correct. And um, so, okay, so, so... And the pain of love, so, which I related to. And, I mean, that, the pain of love, the Florentino had decades of pain. Yes. Because he loved this one woman while still having his conquests and so on. Right. And so I related to that character. I had gone through some of those experiences, and I was there one woman that over decades still holds no, your heart in her hand? <laughs> no, I haven't given any woman that long yet, and I don't have much time left. So I better don't hurry say up. That. you're you're only a little older than me, so you can't say <laughs> that. Um, I got another well, hundred decades. years left. <laughs> um, but maybe actually now I can be like Florentino, and I can have that old love, and. But yes, I pursued him for several years. He rejected me. Somehow I got a cell phone. He would hang up on me. I would send him faxes. He would hang up on you. He would hang up on me. And he, and I would send faxes to him. And, and I just didn't give up. I just was determined. And... and, and when would you have... Give, when, do, when should someone give up and when should someone be persistent? That's a very, very good question. I think if it if it causes your life pain and suffering and it's a detriment of your own life, you should give up. Now, were you maybe also pursuing several at the same time, or was this like I have to have this one? I was no, I was never I have never pursued a book or anything that much in my life or have that much passion. So when he when he finally so what convinced he him? He laughed. When I said I'm Florentino, and I'm not giving up, and I'm going to keep on calling, and he laughed, and when he laughed, I knew I had him. I see. I knew that was a turning point, and I remember being so excited that he just laughed at me it's and didn't hang up on me. And then I remember going to dinner with a director, a, a famous Mexican director, and I told him I'm I'm going to get love in the time of cholera. And he told me the story how Marlon Brando and Sean Penn went to meet Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and they were convinced he was going to do the deal with them. And he left the dinner early and said, I'm sorry, I can't let you guys make my movie. Then I was devastated. I thought if he turned down Marlon Brando and Sean Penn, I don't stand a chance. Yeah, but here's a guy, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who now obviously Marlon Brando and Sean Penn we all think are gods on earth. Right. But Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, 
in, invented an entire literary genre that went worldwide. It was just this whole kind of magic realism idea. Right. And he had his own notion of what authentic was. Yes. And may, it, did he ever tell you why he rejected them? I never asked him why he rejected them. But I ended up, you know, a month or two after that, getting the rights, meeting him, working with him on the script. But And again, I see this, this is related to Night Magic. Um, here, this is a book, uh, a dichotomy between kind of standard um, earth power and kind of the, the chaos of the, the main character, Florentino. Yes. And there's... Again, there's no right answers. It's but it's this this dichotomy that you also found in Night Magic. Which way do you go yes. to have a good life? Yeah, and it's all about this question: of How do you have a good life? Do you go the standard route or do you go the magical route? Right. And there's no real easy answer. Well, I don't think either one of us have gone the easy route. I wish I had gone the easy <laughs> route sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a real joy to. To do that movie, I worked with Shakira on the music. I worked with some great actors. I worked with a great writer, a great filmmaker. I had a great experience in Cartagena. I love Colombia. I love everything, you know, about what the book stands for. I understand it a little better now. And, and so, 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 what's just because I'm curious, what's the economics of a deal like that look like? So, so you 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 get him to agree to some number for the option. Yeah. Then you go. No, to a, we bought the rights. We didn't option it. Okay, so you just bought the rights, and yeah. you for forever after that, you could yes. have made the movie. Yeah. And um, and you, I guess you you combine together some investors to buy those rights, yes. and they were obviously eager. It's a huge book. Yeah. And and then now that you hold this in your hand, you start going to studios and actors, and did yes. you go back to Sean Penn and say, hey? Why don't you star in this? Or well, he he was trying to buy another book. I mean, we had a lot of actors that wanted to play it, and again, you always know you have a really good movie when a lot of actors are coming at you. So, but it seems like you you aim for these like super high quality Nobel Prize level authors, so the actors are going to kind of just show up because this is the one for them. <laughs> It's not my intent. I, my intent is the story. There's something in a story that grabs me. I had no idea that we would get, you know, Javier Bardem in a good cast for that movie. And then how did that movie do? Not well in America, but it did well outside of America. Did you make money? No. So when, when you don't make money on that, um, how do you, what's, what's that feel like? It doesn't like, feel great. Like here you've pursued that I mean, it didn't get years. great reviews in America. It didn't do well in America. It lost money in America. It was very well received in South America. It was very well received in Europe. It's still one of Italy's biggest movies. And I'm still proud of the movie. I feel like I'm a little bit of a feedback addict. Yes. So I can do a podcast or write an article. Yes. And within minutes, really, I can see right away how it's going to do and then if it doesn't do well okay then tomorrow I'll do another one or right. next week I'll do another one right. um, with a movie you spent years trying to get the rights to this another years putting it together and making it and so many people depend on you to lead the ship that's yes. why the actors sign on the writers sign on other investors sign on and now it's done You got, and it doesn't make money you've got to wait your feedback was bad. Yes. <laughs> and you've got to wait, because money's the feedback. You've got to, and even though you felt creatively happy with the process, you've got to wait years now before you come up with the next correct set of things that will create feedback. Yes. So it's hard. It I can't is do hard. it. <laughs> it's very, very hard. And you gotta pick yourself up and you're you're on the pavement and you're upset and you're disappointed and you're having a lot of negative emotions. And the you know one thing about the story that you're telling about me is I have to pick myself up because if I don't pick myself up, where am I going to go? And what am I going to do? Right, you'll just stay on the ground. You're going to stay on the ground, and I don't want to stay on the ground. So what what did you do the day after the movie comes out? And you you know the day the movie comes out, whether pretty I mean, much I they had know. another movie that was coming out that did well, Penelope with uh. Reese Witherspoon, and and so I focused on the next movie and you know I, I'm an action guy so it's like okay I'm gonna feel really bad 
and here's the amount of time I'm going to feel really bad, and now I need to get my life going again. But I think diversification also helps. So, okay, if like a classic case is my port, my stock portfolio went down today, but at least I wrote a great article or I had a good session at the gym or whatever. You, you, right. you diversify the things that kind of trigger the dopamine and serotonin right. and stuff in you. And I had the TV series Las Vegas that was mm. a big hit. And Penelope came out. So, well, so, so I want to ask about Las Vegas. So, you put together that show. That was your first TV series. Yes. It was canceled on the fifth season, yes. right? Which strikes me as unusual. Why would they cancel something right at the verge of? No, we uh, had 112 episodes. Okay, so you were able to go into. What, yeah, we've been in our third syndication. So, so that's is, was that your most lucrative? Is TV more lucrative than movies? Yes, because the syndication just keeps happening. Yes, but it's also moves faster. And Las Vegas was really started the, you, you know, the the main characters were based on real people I knew in Vegas. Because you spent so much time yes. there, it was a natural meeting, and yes. like you said, people were even Philip Roth was so fascinated. Everybody was probably Everybody's fascinated at that. And you had time, stories, yes, and I had all the stories, so I was able to communicate those to a writer and. Off we went. What, what studio? I, I, I NBC. forget. NBC. So, so uh, they they liked it. They picked it up. Yeah. And you just kept getting renewed, and the yeah. writers were good. Yes. Uh, how involved were you in future seasons? In the first few seasons, I was really involved. And then I was off making movies the last two seasons. And then so so... Then there's Empire Falls with HBO. So, you know, I used to work at HBO yes. for, for a short amount of time. And uh, HBO is a great place, obviously, to pitch both movies and TV shows. And this was kind of an in the middle. It's a, it was like a movie miniseries. Well, it was the first limited series. It was five episodes. It was the first limited series. It was the first limited series with movie stars. So Paul it, Newman, Ed Harris... Helen Hunt, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Robin Wright. How, how do you get these people for an HBO? Paul show? Newman got them. Paul Newman got them. Yeah. No one's saying no to him. No. Nobody said no to Paul Newman. Ever in his no. life. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a character. Well, you know, he plays like this. I mean, I've seen him in a bunch of movies, obviously. Uh, the character he plays. It's sort of like when you see Paul Newman in a movie, you just want to be that character no matter how low it is because he's he's cool. Yes. <laughs> and so you and he's independent and you feel that inside of him. Yes. And so he plays this kind of real like low life dirtbag but who's just honest about it. Yes. And it's a very well done character. But he he was able to play that in so many different roles like Nobody's Fool. It was which is one of my favorite movies, Richard Russo book who also wrote Empire Falls. And Paul was all about the emotional truth. You know, whatever you 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 say in dialogue has to be the emotional truth. What are you really feeling when you say these words? What is that what does that mean for an actor? Is that like method style acting like they're connecting with some moment in their past that the character can relate to? Yeah, but it's I mean, he he would say it's the moment that you're in right now. And and you have to be truthful and authentic with what you're feeling before you say it so that the audience feels it. And if you really look at his performances in all of his movies, The Verdict and Nobody's Fool and in Empire Falls, he's telling the truth. He's telling the real truth. I mean, the act. I'm so blessed and grateful for all the actors I've been able to work with because they're incredible artists. And what would you say what would you say is the number one thing you've learned from Paul Newman? Um kindness. He he was a very very kind charitable person. He cared. He cared about everybody. And that's another important thing in acting. The best relationships that we've talked about relationships is with your other actor. If you care about the other actor because the audience knows. We know if two people are talking to each other, if they care about each other. So you can see the truth come out. And he was very generous in his acting. Hmm. And it was very important to him that actors be generous with each other. So, so 
I wanted to kind of um, move forward a little bit and um, see where movies and entertainment and so on are going. You're, you're, you're obviously, and we, we've talked about it, you've been buying great books, making them into movies. You're working on, on several inc- incredible books right now that you've bought the rights to. And yet, I don't know, I saw some statistic recently, I think 15 out of 16 of the top box office movies in the past decade are, are basically comic book sequels. You're, you know, right. Not always, but I'm calling them that. And how do you fight against a system that's, uh, not fight is the wrong word, but how do you stay creatively true to yourself when the system basically is telling you, hey, is this Daredevil number four or you know some obscure literary novel? Well, because the world's changing. I mean, we're in 2017, relationships are changing, technology's changing, our social statuses are changing. You ha- movies and TV have to change with the times because the stories that we would tell a year ago are not relevant today. How we interact with people, how relationships occur, it you know, the most important part of stories are characters and how we behave as as human beings. But then if you buy a book that was written in the 1940s or 50s, like let's yeah. say Laughter in the Dark by N- Nabokov, which you're working on. Yes, um, I updated it. It's a contemporary retelling of a plot that he created. He created some compelling characters and a plot, and I changed it to t- New York 2017. And we're... Mm-hmm going to start casting that movie now and it's a really 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 powerful script and so how did you what is the difference in 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 terms of just this one story what would you say is the difference between 2017 and 1940 well how a husband and wife interact with each other how do they interact differently i mean obviously the 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 dynamic of the, the the man role and the woman role is different now than then because if you look, if you really look at literature and you look at, at books even five years ago or 10 years ago, how women are portrayed in books, they're not portrayed as equals. They're not portrayed as, as empowered people. And if you take Laughter in the Dark, the wife was dismissive. So I can't do a story. Nobody, your children or my children aren't going to relate to that character. So you have to update it. So, so it seems like some parts of a story um, are always going to be classic. Like the, the hero's journey yes. happens in every story, happens in every good article we read. Right. You know, but isn't that changing too? Is isn't it so our tell me. interpretation of a hero changing? Well, that's a good point because if you look at, let's say, television, what are the most um, successful shows in the past decade? You have Sopranos, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Dexter all about bad guys right. who, who are like anti-heroes to some extent, although right. we relate to them like heroes somehow. Right. So well, Dexter's killing bad people and Sopranos is, you know, guy mobster getting therapy and trying to deal with life, you know. So, but th- that's also, those shows were years ago. Where do we go from this point forward? Yeah, so what's the hero now? The hero's flawed and open and self-aware. Because, because we all we we've hidden our flaws. If you look at heroes, they have flaws. So would you say so? So this veers into a, a slightly different topic, which you which you don't really address in your movies. But would you say comedy was ahead of of that idea? Let's say a decade ago. Yeah. So you have stuff like Knocked Up and the Forty Year Old Virgin, absolutely, where the hero was definitely aware I'm a loser. Yes. So I, I I think you're correct in that. Why do you think you haven't done a comedy? I'd like to do a comedy. I really would. So you so your process is though you have to find the book. I have to well it's not just a book, it's a story. I mean, I don't need to just do a book. I can develop internally or, you know, get a script. I I would really like to do a comedy. Have you um have you written your own script that's been made into a movie? Not yet. Is that still a, a oh, goal? Yeah, I'm focused on writing right now. What are you writing? I'm writing a television series in the Bahamas. It takes place in the Bahamas. It t- takes place in the Bahamas. Why in the Bahamas? Because I love the Bahamas, and 
nobody's ever done a show in the Caribbean. And it reminds me of the early days in Las Vegas because it's growing and changing. They're building a $4 billion resort in the Bahamas. And I think there's a lot of storylines that would be intriguing to an international audience. Hmm. And uh, how's it going? Do you have a sense that this is going to get yes, made? And- we have offers for financing right now, and we have a good script and good for season laid out. So, so 40 years after you decide you wanted to write, finally you're going to write a script that's going to be made into a television series. Yes, hopefully more than one. So, so what's... And I'd also like to do something about recovery and self-awareness and, and, and how it's going to evolve and change and be involved in that because I think that's an area that I have some knowledge in. Do you think movies and television are going to last in their current form? I mean, they kind of are based on an older business model. Storytelling's changing. I mean, now we don't want to watch an hour a week. We want to binge watch eight episodes. So that's changed why we don't go to movies. Your kids don't want to go see a two-hour movie. They'd rather watch eight hours of a TV show. Right. So... It's not just because the TV show is better. It's because the storytelling process is different. So they can follow a character over an right. arc of eight to ten episodes rather than a two-hour well, story. Well, I would say the decade between 2000 and 2010 was almost the invention of the arc. Yes. Right? As opposed to the standalone episode right. on TV. Now a season has, has an arc and a series has an arc. Yes. Like Mad Men, the seasons had arcs and the overall series had an arc. Yes. What's happened since 2010? Because I kind of think those movies all started, I mean, those TV series all started before 2010. Is there anything, what's, what's, what's fascinating you now in storytelling? I mean, again, I, I think it has to deal with we're becoming socially aware And things are evolving from our personalities to every area of our life is changing. Every area. How we meditate, how we function as humans, how we work, how we Uber. How we age, right? How we age. You're you're beginning a new project for the first time as you're approaching the the end of your sixth decade. Yes. So, 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 I mean... You and I could live to be well over a hundred and 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 be productive until we pass on. So everything is changing in our lives, and that's going to change everything about storytelling. And I think that's the big divide in Hollywood today: is you have people that don't want, you know, they love movies, they love the history of movies, and they're still pitching the same movie that will never get made or never get seen because people don't want to see that same old stuff anymore. The audiences have changed. Our children grew up on Facebook, on on Snapchat and Instagram. Well, TV ratings have definitely gone down across the board just because supply is also in, in, has gone incredibly larger yes. you know, with Netflix and, and all the cable channels doing original programming. Right. I don't know if movie... I mean, movie revenues have gone up, but that's because ticket prices have gone up. I don't think movie ticket sales... They have not. And so book sales, again, there's more books out there, so the number of books sold has gone up, but I don't think... I think individual copies of books have probably gone down on average. You know, there's breakouts like Fifty Shades of Grey, but on average, they've gone down. But meanwhile, a, a, a good viral YouTube video will get 100 million views in a, in a day. And so YouTube and those kind of outlets are going to be where our product is is going to be shown. And you've got to show product that is going to stimulate an audience that is much different than it was yesterday. Well, Scott... So it's exciting. Yes, it is exciting. I'm excited because I am constantly... I always feel like these podcast sessions are therapy for myself as I explore my own reinventions and my reinvention possibilities so uh thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all this with us and i want i can't wait for the i can't wait for the bahamas series and laughter in the dark and i know also the the joan of arc movie you're working on uh what else are you excited about that you're working on 
um, Station Eleven. Oh, Station Eleven. Seth Rogen writing the script. Uh, oh, oh, he's we'll, he's not writing the script. But. We'll we'll edit that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> Station Eleven, though, one of my favorite books of the past year. Yeah. So, um, um, and I'm doing one called The God Wave. So I'm doing a lot of projects that deal with the future. I'm excited to see, you know, what transcends in the future. Very so, excited. Well, thanks once again, Scott, for for coming on the show. Thank you. And when uh, when your next thing comes out, we'll have you on again. Great. Thank you. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen, I have a big favor to ask you, and it will only take 30 seconds or less, and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know. And you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less, and if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.